Welcome, everybody. I am here with Colleen. Hi, everyone. And um, we're here, it's Colleen and I uh, episode. Again, we like to do these every once in a while because it's always just fun to, to chat about the different things that are going on in our lives and our Reiki practice. And one of the things that we are going to chat about today, actually the thing that we are going to chat about today is Colleen just got back from Mount Karama. Um, well, I guess now she's gotten back a few weeks ago, especially by the time this is released, she'll have gotten back a few weeks ago. Um, so she was teaching there uh, on Mount Karama. She was in Japan for about three weeks. Um, and so we thought that we would just come and talk about your trip calling, the experience, a little bit about why you go to Mount Karama, what it is, because some people may not know, um, and uh, just hear all about your trip and some really extraordinary experiences. I had the privilege to to talk to Colleen from time to time while she was there and um, uh, just hear about some of her stories and some about the experiences of her and the class and um, with William. So Colleen, do you want to go ahead and talk about what you were doing in Japan and why you went to Karamayama? Well, William ran and I planned this trip really a couple of years ago to teach on Mount Karama, which is the birthplace of Reiki. It's where Yusui Sensei actually received Reiki. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail about that. But we planned that several years ago. Well, really, I think we planned it for 2021, even before COVID. So um, before the pandemic, and then of course, during the pandemic, um, you know, everyone was in lockdown and then Japan actually did not allow any tourism until October of 2022. So last year, of course, uh, 2021 was considered to be the 100 year anniversary of, do I have my dates right? 2022 was the 100 year anniversary of when Yusui Sensei received Reiki energy on uh, Mount Karama after a 21-day meditation that he had done. And he was there to achieve the state of Anshinditsume, or spiritual peace, and that the spiritual peace would include his purpose. So 2022 was considered to be the 100-year anniversary, and since we couldn't be there live, we were really fortunate that Lena Takahashi and Monikai Mohammed, who live in Japan, were able to, uh, we were able to do a whole celebration with William Rand, Robin, and myself. Um, and uh, Lena and Munikai on Mount Karama and in Taniai Village, which was part of, uh, which is where Yusui Sensei was actually born. So they did that via Zoom, and it was a beautiful ceremony. And so we planned on April 2023 for our live trip to Mount Karama with William Rand. Lena always um, accompanies us to translate and help with all of the logistics for it. So we planned on that. However, we weren't sure when Japan was actually going to open to tourism. And so that didn't happen in, until October. And so many people had already registered for the class for if and when it actually took place live. So when they opened in October, we made all of our plans. And I was fortunate to arrive in Japan a week before the class started. The first class started on Mount Karama uh, and spent a week in Kyoto. William was actually invited to teach in Taiwan and also in Korea. So he taught in both of those locations um, and then met me in Japan. 
and Lena also. So I was really excited to spend a week beforehand in Kyoto. The times I had been before 2016 and 2017, I had had been to Tokyo, but not really spent any time in Kyoto. And so I was there by myself, which was really um, fun and interesting and learning how to navigate around Japan. They don't speak a lot of English. So um, the train stations and things have English translation. But I will tell you what, Google Maps tells you everything. It, it Anywhere that I wanted to go, I would just tape, type in the names and it would tell me where the train station was or where a bus station was, which train, which platform, how many stops, get off here, go to this next one and take it for this part, walk to here, here's the next bus stop. Everything was very detailed in Google Maps. So I actually really enjoyed that part. It was fun for me to just feel confident that I could get where I was going. And so I was able to, um, the very first and most important stop was I had two that were grand kid um, requests. I was wondering if you were going to mention that. <laughs> well, it was so funny because here I am, I'm ready to go and I'm going to go to one of uh, Gion, which is a really neat district. Um, near me in Kyoto, near where I stayed. And um, I was talking to Robin's daughter, Luna, and found out that there was a Pokemon Center close by. And so that had to be my very first stop. We call so, it a Pokemon Center, but it's just a store. <laughs> it is just a store, but yeah, it, it is... It, yeah, it, Luna's obsessed with Pokemon right now. So... Um, yeah, so you can keep going, but I just have to say that she is like, she is in it, in her po full Pokemon phase right now. She is full Pokemon all the time. And so um, that was really cute and very fun because I, for those of you that know me, I really love technology. And even though it takes me a long time to figure it all out, I'm fascinated by the possibilities. So I figure out how to get to this Pokemon Center on Google Maps, and I have Google Translate, which the people in Japan are really friendly, very polite. It's very safe and comfortable to go anywhere. So if I needed to, I could stop anybody and show them Google Translate, and it would speak from you know English to Japanese or Japanese to English. So anyway, I go to the Pokemon store and it's a pretty big center and it was packed. I mean, it was packed with kids and people and it's this, you know, big store, everything Pokemon. And I got to FaceTime with Luna live. So I'm going around showing think her like, everything. Think like, um, like a most people or I would say a lot of people here have probably been to a Disney store, like in the mall, think like that, but like 10 times the size. So that's kind of what it's, what it looks like all Pokemon merchandise, stuffies of all the different characters, all of that kind of thing. Cards, pencils, big yeah. things, little things, all the things, you know, kids everywhere. And in Japan, they always have the dial up things that you are not dial up, but you know, you put in a, what we think of as a quarter here and, put in a hundred yen and, you know, turn the thing and you get the little ball with whatever surprises in it. So we did that. And it was so much fun to just think of her at six years old and her memories. Of course, I, I FaceTimed with her and other things too, but um, her memory of being able to actually talk to me live while I'm in Japan and over the thing that was so fascinating to her, which was Pokemon. So that was my first stop. The next day, um, and then I did go to Gion later that afternoon, which was a beautiful district. It was very crowded. Um, I was there during 
the Cherry Blossom Festival. And also I found out later that it was like uh, their kids' spring break and school was starting the following week. So it was very, very busy everywhere, which I actually really loved. I, I liked being in the rhythm of it all and the city of it all and all the different people. One of the very fun things that when you go there is, and I didn't do this, but I might next time, is that they have um, they have kimono rental places everywhere. And so if you want to dress in a full kimono, they do your hair, they do your makeup, and you're dressed beautifully in these kimonos. So lots of people were doing that for photo photo shoots and whether it was just their selfie or whatever. Um, but you could see a whole lot of people were doing that. So I actually was able to take some really neat pictures of people. I asked permission, um, take some neat pictures of people uh, in their kimonos. Uh, and so I got some really neat photos, which I will share, but I'm truthfully, I, I've had more jet lag this time than I have in the past. And then, of course, coming home, I, I actually have lots of family things going on and moving my in-laws who are 95 and 91. They're moving into independent living um, today. So I've been busy with that all week, too. So anyway, and other grandkids and people to see. So I will do more photos. Um, so then the next day, I was talking to my 11 year old grandson. And his most important thing was that I went to the monkey park. So in Arashiyama. So I get to the monkey park, not realizing it's at the top of a big hill, <laughs> a really big hill. Like I was climbing that hill and it's all groomed and everything. So fine. But I was climbing that hill for a good solid hour. Like it's, it's uphill. So um, at the top, of course, are all the monkeys and they're loose. So you can actually hang out with them. You can't touch them or anything, but they're, they're very used to people and very close by. And of course, as a major animal lover, I was super excited and in addition, one of the things that you can do there is rent what is called a pocket Wi-Fi so that I had Wi-Fi and they're only, a, you know, when I say this big, they're smaller than your cell phone and they're lightweight. Hmm. So I could hook up to Wi-Fi in these rural areas. And so I was able to FaceTime him with the monkeys at the top of the mountain. And then also my granddaughter, Ava, that was Calvin, my granddaughter, Ava, um, hopped on for a little while, my, my daughter-in-law. So we were all able to do the monkeys together. And so then I had the long climb down, which is, of course, usually easier. Arashiyama was a beautiful location with um, the trees were all different shades because it's spring. And so all the different shades of green and then the, the cherry blossoms and this big river. Lots of people, again, went to, there's a bamboo forest there. So I went there. And the same thing with a lot of the, um, uh, in the bamboo forest, it was pretty crowded. So, but again, I really enjoyed it because it was, like I say, it was a rhythm. It was the people, it was the rhythm, it was the, just the feel of, of being there and for me connecting in spiritually. And so I've learned with Reiki and really utilizing Reiki on the fly that I can move into that state even in the, the thick of the busyness. And so the other thing that I loved in that area was called the kimono forest. And so they have these probably five foot tall tubes with antique kimonos in them. And so it's this whole kind of forest of those. And again, I'll show you, I'll, I will be posting some photos when I, I can get that far. 
So I did that. And one of the things to know about me is that I have been gluten-free for over 25 years, a long, long time. And so for me, uh, eating gluten-free is essential. And so there were a lot of things I couldn't eat um, because they had soy sauce in them. And uh, soy sauce has has gluten in it. Their soy, their soy sauce. Their soy sauce. They, Not all soy sauce around yeah. the world does, but here in the United States and in Japan, it, it has gluten. So I did miss out on some of the street food. But what I actually did, first of all, I had the app gluten-free around me so I could find gluten-free restaurants um, around me. But I also printed out in English and Japanese that I have celiacs and that I need um, everything to have, you know, not to have wheat, rye or barley. And so everybody was really good about that. And so, of course, I did find things to eat. But for those of you that um, part of what you're doing is looking out for the street food, it looked amazing. <laughs> and so if that's part of what you love about travel, the street food in Japan, of course, is immaculate as far as feeling safe eating it and every different kind and, you know, really, really neat things to try. Um, but for me, that was not so much of what I'm doing. And the other interesting thing there is what we have here, 7-Elevens. They have, they're called, they're 7 -Eleven. Um, also called Family Mart, and some of the different stores actually have quite a bit of food that people there eat um, regularly, like, you know, regularly go for lunches or meals. So I was able to eat there. And again, there's Google Translate. So I could take the Google Translate, I could take my phone to the ingredients list, and it would scan it and tell me everything that was was in it. So anyway, I know that's not high on the list of what everybody's listening about, but for people who are traveling, yeah. you know, one of the things you find in the US is that a lot of people are aware of their food allergies. So this is the way that you get around it there. The Google Translate took me a little bit more time to shop, but once I kind of learned what there was, and for me, plain white rice balls, <laughs> so which actually I really liked. So um, that was great. So um, I did that. And then one of the ones that I really enjoyed um, was called the Philosopher's Path. And I went back there a couple of times. It was not quite as crowded. And it was beautiful. The It's a whole walk probably maybe up to four miles, you know, you can go as far or not as far as you want. And it had a lot of shrines and temples along the way with a canal. The cherry blossoms were over the canal, lots of people strolling and, you know, ducks on the water and some of the street musicians playing different things. It was so nice to hear and a super easy walk. So at that time, I was really ready for that. And um, again, another grandchild thing was found an antique kimono store at the Philosopher's Path. And that's where I was able to FaceTime Ava, my 16-year-old granddaughter, and uh, find something for her there. And that, that part of it, I know, doesn't sound as interesting, but it was really fun. It was fun to be able to connect that way and to talk with the kids and that that's part of their world is that, you know, for for us at my age, that was like the Jetsons someday or, you know, off in the sci-fi land that there would be the possibility that. My age too. Your age too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we didn't even have international calling. Yeah. Yeah. You we know, did, but yeah. I say even, easy. that's really new. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the last time I went to Japan in 2017, we still didn't really have like, um, you know, if you call your phone company, I have Verizon and you could use Travel Pass, it's $10 a day and they, your phone is the same as it is here. Yeah. 
where in 2017, when I went, I actually had to change out the SIM card, Mm -hmm. which is a whole other level Mm -hmm. of dealing with things. With SIM cards, you have a new phone number. It doesn't work the same. And so the travel pass is for sure the way to go. If any of you are not familiar with that and you are traveling to another country, it is very worth the $10 a day because everything works Um, and you're not on roaming. So you don't end up with some horrific phone bill at the end of it. So I went through the philosopher's path and did did the different temples and um, places and shrines and things. And they're so interesting because like one of the shrines that I went to, they were the monkey shrine. And so the the statues in the front and everything is the monkeys. And then the next one was the rats. And uh, the next one was cats. So and they were all in the same temple. So I would go to one of the like the Chinese zodiac. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know if cat is but rat and monkey definitely is. So Well, and of course, I was doing monkeys for Calvin, because he was all about he's like, monkeys are the thing. So so I was doing that. And I have to admit, I did not spend a lot of time really informing myself about a lot of it, because I just was experiencing it. Just wanted to wander. I just wanted to wander. And so then after all of that, you went to Mount Karama. Yes. Okay. So after that, well, no, before that, we went to the um, the oh, conference, yeah. the Reiki conference. Yeah, that's right. The Gendai Reiki Ho conference. Yeah, and that was that. on a Friday night. And people from all over the world were gathering for that conference. And uh, we knew we weren't going to be able to go because... Uh, it was the the dates we had already set for the class conflicted with it. And um, Friday was the one time we were going to be able to go. So Lena, William, and I went to that. That was in Osaka. So a little bit of a train ride to get there. And we got there and it was just lovely to meet some of the different people from around the world. Um, Hiroshi Doi Sensei, of course, Hyakuten Inamoto, and um, and so many more. There's too many names to to mention the names, but there were about 300 people there, so it was quite a large gathering, and it was there for the weekend. And so when William got there, we realized that actually I could go up to Mount Karama the next day, um, and. Uh, everybody was just checking in for the class. And then Sunday, we were just doing orientation and things for the class so that he could actually stay at the conference. Now, you were you were teaching, just for, for reference, I don't remember if you said that you were teaching a master class and then you were going to teach a Karuna class. Yes. It was for the master class. So two different classes and six nights, seven days okay. each so that we had plenty of time on the mountain. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, that conference was amazing. The music was incredible. It was really fun to meet people and just to be in that kind of a gathering. So uh, William ended up staying and I ended up going up to Mount Karama with Lena. Saturday was check-in day and people get, you know, get there all during the day and into the night. Um, So Uh, We arrived there and got to spend time. When I say we arrived there, we are actually very blessed to be able to to stay at a Ryokan Inn um, right at the base of the temple on Mount Karama. So it's still on the mountain, but it's before the gate going into the temple. And which is such a great experience because it's a really authentic Japanese experience. And they don't typically um, have foreigners stay there. That's somewhat of a tradition in some of the smaller villages like that. Um, And for all the various reasons 
that they do that. But we have a previous relationship with them and Lena has a good relationship with them. So they invite us and they have invited us back. We'll go back next year again. But um, anyway, it's very traditional. And so it's kind of like a big slumber party because we are all there in our rooms and we eat together and, you know, we're all living in the same place. And um, it's, again, very traditional. So we're on the authentic uh, tatami mats. No, that's not accurate. Tatami mats are the, are the bamboo part that you walk on. So the futon type. Mm -hmm. rice. I'm not sure. They're filled Maybe with rice, correct? What's that? Aren't they filled with rice, the beds? Uh, no, they were super comfortable. Like no, I mean, I every thought, bit. Yeah, comfortable. I just. Yeah, they're every bit as comfortable as a bed, but they are on the floor. Yeah. And so um, just neat with an onsen, you know, so soaking bathing and. Um, one of the most amazing things, of course, in Japan, the quality of their hospitality is their number one thing. And so Sugaku-san and the family, their hospitality is just exceptional. And one of the most exceptional parts of it is the kaiseki cuisine that they provide for us every dinner. So we have a, a, you know, kind of a regular breakfast. She would pack us lunches so that we could go up on the mountain and have a, a carry on lunch. And those were different sandwiches. And for those of us who like the rice balls, she makes fabulous rice balls and rice balls are, oh, you know, kind of like a, a triangle shape and maybe two inches thick and three inches around, something like that. And they're mixed with plum sauce or salmon or something else or plain. And so um, I always opted for those because I like those. But the dinners, the kaiseki cuisine, one of the most important things when you are a guest is to truly honor the hospitality that they are offering. The quality of the food is all you know, the freshest farm to table type of food and the Kaiseki chef in this case um, really studied for over 20 years. So and you're talking about an extremely high quality of food. Isn't, isn't it generational as well? Aren't they generational? So. Yeah. I think yeah. you said that. I don't know if it's a different chef this time, but you said that last time that they were in Kaiseki cuisine traditionally or, or I shouldn't say traditionally but a lot of times is generational where it's passed down through the family and probably just raised that way again I some of these things I hesitate to say because I'm not like super informed on mm -hmm. the specifics and and the accuracy of what I think I know about it um so let me give There's that caveat it's uh there is a chef's table on chef's table is a Netflix show. Um, and there is a chef's table solely, I'm pretty sure I watch a lot of food shows, but I'm I'm almost positive it's chef's table. And the whole thing is dedicated to Kaisaki cuisine. Um, and I think the chef, I, I think the chef is it's just usually on one chef. And so I think it is just one chef that does Kaisaki cuisine. Um, and it's just I mean, it's mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I can't imagine what it is, you know, eating it, but like that watching what goes into the Kaiseki cuisine from that perspective. And, um, uh, it's, it was really, so it's funny because I got to watch it before the, either the last time you went, or maybe it was just after to have a greater understanding of what goes into traditional Kaiseki cuisine. It's, uh, it's pretty extraordinary. It is extraordinary. The first time in 2016 when we stayed there and, you know, we had no idea what it was and probably did not have the complete appropriate manners and appreciation for what it was. This time, of course, we completely know. It's about a two-hour um, course. They bring out eight to ten courses and 
Um, each course is beautifully prepared and most of all beautifully presented. And so I have to be honest, some of the nights it was like, oh, so much food. Um, and then by the end of the time, it was like, oh, I can eat all of it. <laughs> so definitely got used to it. Um, and of course, building up the energy from the mountain. So that was our greeting was to start there. And then on Sunday, that's when we started going up onto Mount Karama and started our Reiki experiences actually on the mountain. And um, the mountain is about 1900 feet up. So here in Oregon, that's more of a foothill size. We have big mountains, but it's it's a mountain yeah. and it has mountain weather and things. So definitely dressing in layers. It's about kind of comparable to about 80 flights of stairs up. The temple has been there since the eighth century. And so it has been a holy place, a sacred place um, for uh, Buddhist traditions, Shinto traditions, um, for centuries and millennia. And so you can feel it. The energy is very palpable. And the mountain itself is very groomed. So there's steps leading up to everything. And some of the steps you can see were uh, put in more, more recently. And then some of them are quite a bit older. And um, that, you know, I'd I didn't really see any that we are actually using that would go all the way back centuries like that. Um, maybe centuries, but not millennia. Most of them were, you know, pretty updated. Now they had a typhoon that hit in 2018. And so um, the typhoon really leveled a lot of the shrines on the mountain and a lot of the trees. So they are in the process of replanting um, the trees. And we were really fortunate to have time with the main priest of the mountain. And he was explaining how they're not just going in and doing what they think they should do. They are listening to the mountain to see what to plant what shrines to build, and they are very deeply engaged with nature. Now, their particular uh, traditions are unique to Mount Karama. And so they have, like, for instance, this main priest, um, monk, I'm not sure if they are called priests or mon monks, kind of, I hear it interchangeably. Um, and so it's it's their unique style of Buddhism, and it is very specifically very nature-based. That's so fascinating to think that, you know, they have to think about or listen, you know, uh, is what I mean, but that the, the shrines and the replanting and all of that that they have to do are going to be there for millennia. Yeah. It's such a different perspective of like building of than what we think of, of like building a house, you know, or right. even anything that we do spiritually, that it is like that they are, they have the responsibility of carrying that, not carrying it like, but carrying on that tradition of this really, because Mount Karama is a spiritual mountain. It's not just reiki um you know yeah. people would make pilgrimage there uh for their spiritual practices and like you said buddhism um and that they they are a part of that process that it's going to be there for people to come to for spiritual refuge spiritual growth you know whatever you want to call that for potentially millennia like yeah. another like that's that's wild. That is a very interesting perspective to like go go into that idea. Just going into and that's how yeah, they alone, like actually thinking about that is like that is something that they're actually responsible for. 
and how they think about it. Yeah. And they're very aware of their part in the lineage. Um, the, the priest that we were meeting with, um, you know, he's, he was very aware of listening. He was raised there. His mother was part of it and he was raised there. So this is a lifelong um, practice and study. And, um, you know, the whole village is engaged. Sugaku-san, the, the owner of the inn, you know, is also friends and part of it all. So very close knit because Karama village is really small. It's maybe three quarters of a mile long in total with one road. Uh, and the one road has houses on either side and it's big enough. It has a little post office and things like that um, and some residences, but it's, it's actually pretty small. So Anyway, they are rebuilding. So, for instance, the shrine at the very top of the mountain that was, you know, is a common photograph that we see in Reiki. That one was one that that was um, uh, blown over in the typhoon. And it still has the foundation, but they haven't actually rebuilt the shrine, which is um, typically canvas. So it's not... It's not even a, a whole body. But anyway, it was really interesting to listen to him and their decision making around what they're planting. So when you're on the mountain, they've cleaned up a lot of it um, where, you know, a lot of blowdown happened with the trees and things. And then the replanting you can see because all the trees have the protective sleeves on them as they're you know as they're growing but they talked about replanting four different types of trees that the mountain and the trees told them they wanted there Interesting. so um again it was cherry blossom season so the trees in the main temple are you know covered with cherry blossoms so it's just beautiful just beautiful there is a tram that takes you part way up um, so you can get to the main temple and then to actually go to the part where Yusui Sensei, it's thought the part where he received the gift of Reiki. Um, that's quite a bit more of a stair climb up. I do have some videos of me climbing those stairs. I was really huffing and puffing. So by the time I got to the top, so... I'll be I'll be uh, voiceovering those because some of them are really beautiful. Like one of them, I haven't looked at everything yet. I, I just haven't had a chance to, to go back to my videos and photos. But one of them just, and I think, Robin, that's the one when I was FaceTiming you mm -hmm. going up. And as you know, I was stopping every 10 steps, you know, and, and trying to breathe. So I get to the top and I'm videoing the location of the roots where it's thought that Yusui Sensei tripped over the tree root, injured his toe, placed his hands over his toe, um, and it healed his toe and stopped the pain he was in, stopped the bleeding. And uh, that's when he knew that not only had he received the universal life force energy of Reiki, but that it also could heal. And that's when he knew his purpose was to share this healing uh, energy with the world. And so that was his very first decision. So going up to that location, and it's pretty well thought that would have to be it because it is the location that would be the most likely um, when you get to the top of the mountain, because when you go, you know, you get to that spot, then you go to the other side, you're going back down uh, to Kibunu and or Kibune. And anyway, I was videoing up there and the light show that came through my video, just beautiful. And some of the other students that were videoing up there too, same thing like you know how we have that picture of gator with the rainbow yeah, yeah all the lens 
a lot of rainbows like yeah. that and the the light shows and and different than like a lens flare it really and maybe they are a type of a lens flare but i'll tell you very different looking than that so when you're at the top of the mountain um it was very cold some of the days so we were pretty funny because we get up there and we're determined we're gonna we're gonna do these experiences up here in the top of the mountain and there were 14 16 of us at that point and so we're determined we're going to be at the top of this mountain and we are going to receive our ignitions to reiki there and so we finish with the ignition and you know it's like okay let's go into some self reiki and i open my eye and i'm looking at everybody and we're all like i think the practical decision is to go down and go to the classroom <laughs> cool. we'll, we'll practice down yeah. at the bottom so that was one of the first days and uh, the first and second days were pretty cold and then it warmed up and there are also locations on the mountain that we could have private time and private places to be that we were able to um, do some of the other experiences by the main temple and um, and things so anyway um, so it wasn't cold every day and the whole time but you know, you definitely, it's still mountain weather. Yeah. You know, just like here, you go up on the mountain and what's happening partway down the mountain can be very different than what's at the top. Yeah. And so even though we think of it as 1900 feet, isn't, you know, a, a huge mountain, it still had mountain weather. Yeah. 2000 feet difference is a really big difference. It is a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a snowboarder and there's a, there's a, resort that's a little lower and then you go up 2000 feet and there's a resort that's higher and it'll be raining down below and snowing up top yes you know so well and i've been uh, speaking of mount hood i've been on mount hood where it's super cold down below and warm up at top yeah, because you're about the cloud line yeah if you have the in and in, in, if you have an air inversion that's true yes so one of the couple of the things that I wanted to hear about are the peace grid stories. You have a couple of really cool ones. So the temple and then the one with uh, Lena. Okay. So fast forward, there's so much. I mean, exactly. I like, know. There's so much. I could go into so much detail, yeah. but and we'll do it over time. Have really neat stories, but those are the two that like kind of, you know, they stay with you a bit. They're pretty cool. So we were really blessed. Again, Lena has made a relationship with the people on the mountain and with the priest. And um, William had taken, you know, he has, he started his Peace Grid project back in the 1990s. And so for those of you not familiar with what we're talking about, I'll, I'll summarize it real quickly. So he um, had six Peace Grids made. They're about of a foot across a piece and they're made out of gold and uh copper and stainless steel so 24 karat gold on the outside really beautiful and they're in the shape of a lotus flower and on each petal 12 petals is a crystal and in front of the crystal is a symbol representing one of the 12 major world religions including atheism and independent spiritual path so it's all inclusive and it, one of them that says and all others so there's no specific like only these religions are represented because we know there's more way more than 12. and then there's a center crystal with the reiki symbols underneath it and then an inscription around the center crystal that says May the followers of the world's religions and spiritual paths work together to create peace among all people on earth. So he physically took these grids around the world. So he took one to the North Pole, one to the South Pole. He took one to Jerusalem. It's on the uh, in the old city on the wall of the Temple of Solomon in an art gallery there. One is in the Reiki Center in Michigan, and one is in the Reiki Center in Hawaii. The sixth one 
he knew was supposed to be placed on Mount Karama, or he was guided. He didn't know that before, but he was guided. So he took it there to Lena in uh, 2019 and had Lena take it um, take it up to Mount Karama on one of her journeys there, which she did. And she gave it to the priest at that time. And um, then, of course, the pandemic came and she was unable to go back and find out more about the peace grid. Last year, 2022, when she was there for the 100-year ceremony, uh, Lena is Ukrainian and her family and her village are all and were right in uh, one of the very first villages that uh, was in the war zone and her brother in the military, and she had to evacuate her mother and move her to Japan with her. So she was telling her story to the priest, and they had been gathering from around the world for prayers for peace, which is one of their main um, practices, is praying for peace. So she went last year and asked them about the peace grid and, you know, where was it? And he said, it's in the main temple in the prayer room where the priests themselves gather to pray for peace. And so this year when we went, we had made a, a pretty big donation to the temple from the um, proceeds from the 100-year ceremony last year. And again, because of COVID, uh, Lena was not actually able to give that to them until this year. And so we physically took the donation and we were able to meet with the priest and he did a whole blessing ceremony for us in the main temple. And then we actually asked to see the peace grid and he brought it out and showed it to us. And it had been on the altar while he was doing our blessing ceremony. And we were able to take photographs of it. It actually isn't available for the public to see because it is in their private prayer room. Um, so it's not like out in the open for anybody that's going there and to go and see. You're traditionally not even allowed to take photos in there, correct? In no. The temples? Yeah. No, in fact, you don't take photos in there. Um, but he actually allowed us to do that. And mainly, William has a camera that is so high definition that uh, it, it doesn't need a flash because mm -hmm. it's dark in there. But when you see the interior of the temple, it's no wonder that the peace grid belongs there because it's all just beautiful gold and, um, you know, just so many beautiful items and, you know, such a place of reverence. So that was a, just an incredible experience. Getting to talk with him for over an hour was an amazing experience and just really blessed. Um, so that that was one of the beautiful experiences. Well, and when we were doing the 100-year celebration last year in 2022, um, in that whole process, and that's also when World Peace Reiki came in. Correct? Yes, yes. And it was, so there was a, there was a whole, this is like a whole long story around it, but uh, that was when the war in Ukraine started. And so there was this process of the hundred year celebration happening, this, this uh, peace grid process that was happening. Like Lena has pictures of it on the, the spot in front of the main temple where heaven meets earth. Um, and that, that whole process that she was going through being so involved in the hundred year celebration and during all of this, that, that, cause it was just last year, you know, we think of it as so much longer, but it was just last year in March of last year that this was all occurring too, which 
relates to your next story around the peace grid. So, so the next story around the peace grid was back in 2017, Lena had uh, joined William and I were teaching back then too. And um, the same thing in Karamasu. And Lena was actually there as a student that time, but she also did a lot of translating for us. And so I actually had taken my own personal peace grid with my crystals um, for the altar. And then I actually gifted her that peace grid um, in 2017. So again, for those of you maybe not, oh, excuse me, not familiar, the uh, peace grid like that is a photograph of the peace grid at the North Pole on a large laminated piece. And then I had my own crystals that were imbued with Reiki that are placed on the, the grid um, with the intention, again, of the world's followers, um, the, of all the religions and spiritual paths working together to create peace. So Lena took that back with her and that peace grid was on the altar when she was uh, helping William with his class in 2018. And that was right after the typhoon. And so they, like within a week, after the typhoon. So the mountain was actually closed. But again, the relationship that Lena had with the priest, he actually allowed them to use what is called the San Juan station, and which has what we would think of as the mental emotional symbol, uh, the Sanskrit symbol of that, that it's thought that that's where the, um, the, the mental emotional symbol came from. So anyway, they did um, their ignitions there, and that's where the Isui Holy Fire 3 upgrade happened. And I was here in the United States, but I knew that that was happening at the time, or I knew something was happening, and I could see it, how the energy of that grid or of the, the upgrade went through that grid and just rippled out to the people like and the animals and everything. And of course, for us, that was significant because that was also when the animal Reiki energy said it was ready. And that was because part of that upgrade that was so significant was how powerful unification consciousness came in and so really the awareness of humanity unifying individually unifying with our own self and with the circle of life that we are a part of the circle of life which to wrap around to this story is why it was so powerful for me to be with all the people even though it was so busy in Kyoto, um, because I just felt that being a part of life there. And so it all relates to these experiences and, and how that felt inside um, that I wasn't necessarily expressing, but I was feeling. So anyway, back to this year's story. So this year, um, the in the master class was the um was on the day of our monthly uh world peace meditation day which is the second wednesday of every month and people from around the world work with their own grids or sending reiki to the six peace grids you can um, by the way you can look up the peace grid story the monthly peace grid meditation on reiki.org there's a link there that takes you to all of those resources getting grids how to do it all of that so i, I don't think we said that before i don't think so and we'll put that in the show notes yeah so in the description so people can find a link to it because the stories around it are amazing and how william started that whole project is um you know really inspiring 
how did he just make those and do that? It's pretty, it's William. <laughs> it's William. <laughs> yeah, it's like I know. I think I'll do this and did it. Yeah. So anyway, um, now currently, that monthly meditation has over four hundred and eighty thousand people that have signed up to receive the peace grids, download the peace grids off of Reiki.org, and then also participate. So people from around the world send Reiki to the peace grids at 730 um, in their own time zone every month. And you can feel it. So, and you could engage in that even if you don't have Reiki. But you know, for Reiki people, it's something that we practice regularly and we use distance Reiki to do so. And it connects everybody with that intention and that prayer. So anyway, that was happening during the master class. And there were a lot of logistics around it that to try to navigate. And so that part was an interesting aspect of it for me, but not for everybody else. So, um, and mainly around the appropriateness of the dinner, making sure that we were honoring the um, our hosts and honoring the peace grid at the same time. So anyway, everyone went up to the classroom to send Reiki to that particular peace grid that was Lena's grid, an actual physical grid there. It connects to all the other grids, the one on the mountain, the ones in the other locations. And the whole thing is so powerful and it's really palpable how powerful that is. And sending Reiki to that grid. The next day, uh, Lena's brother, who is actually in Bakhmut, I think I'm saying that correctly, in Ukraine, and he is in the heaviest um, fighting right now. He's in the military, and he's in really the most dangerous zone. He, She is not able to contact him, but he does contact her, you know, every so often to let her know, you know, he's okay. He can't really ever divulge any information or anything other than she knows that he's in that area. So he sent her a video the morning after the Peace Grid meditation and said he felt this protection over him and they could feel this energy of protection the video showed that a bomb actually hit his the the location he was in maybe 50 feet away from where they all were no one was harmed and i don't even know if it was 50 feet i don't even know if it was 50 feet it's probably closer than 50 feet yeah i would say it's, yeah yeah very close like like across your house yeah from one end of your house to another maybe not even that far one end to the middle of the house so 50 feet is close but it was very close and no one was hurt lena actually shared with us that she had his name and their others names on the grid underneath the grid on a piece of paper that uh, was for him so that was a really powerful moment. Um, in the next class, we also had people that were in two opposing com countries that um, I'm not really at liberty to, to, to talk about. They're at, in countries at war with one another. And um, they were actually doing Reiki together on the top of the mountain, just sharing peace and love and caring and it was it felt like with everything that was going on with everything with the class with all the people the power and the love of the students and all of us together was just incredible 
And for me, it was the takeaway from the whole thing was the support and the love between the students, all of us, Sugaku-san, the people of the mountain, just this beautiful feeling of peace and the possibility of peace. And um, I would have to say that the group of students were just so exceptional, just, and just being people, not anything like, oh, they're all experts in Reiki, although many are, um, or teachers of Reiki. Many people are just there for their own personal experience, but just the heart of all of the people sharing was for me the blessing of the whole trip. Um, I loved the mountain. I loved the energy of it. You know, there's places on it, particularly one location that's in the middle of a, a mandala, and it's palpable. Like you can feel the energy coming through you from above, coming through you. Like you say, it's the, the place where heaven meets earth um, and earth meets heaven. It's really palpable. The, the place where it was the most palpable was the love of the people. And small miracles, you small know, miracles. more things. And they're also huge miracles. Huge, like, yeah. The, the story that you talked about with Lena's brother and, you know, you called me the day after or something and telling yeah. me the story and how much that, energy mattered and whether others were praying for them but like you said they felt it over them and like that's a small miracle in the grand scheme of the, the world but a huge miracle in the grand scheme of their life yeah and the miracle of those two people that you said were sharing freaky together that were from traditionally opposing countries and the miracle that and it seems like such a small miracle but that's a miracle when we talk about that with reiki that you know sometimes it's subtle and the changes happen over time you know or sometimes it's more subtle how the changes are working and then other times there's miracles that happen and to recognize when there's miracles and those things were miracles and there's a few other stories from the class that you had shared that <clears throat> you know, we don't really have time to talk about in this, in this moment that were miracles and how that all worked. And that's, um, miracles come from people. And like you said, the heart and the love that were there. And that is, those are miracles. It, it felt like that. <clears throat> I know when I called you to share the story of the peace grid, I, <laughs> it makes me teary now. Um, you know, really just how much it matters. Yeah. You know, it does. It does. And it, it, it was such a, it's such a palpable evidence of how much it matters. And again, not just those moments, but all the moments and, you know, thinking of all the different people that are just bringing their love and their heart and, that's what we can do. You know, there's, there's not a lot that I know what to do, because I want to pray for people in all the countries that are dealing with this, those that we can think are the oppressors, those that are the oppressed, all of the above. I, I don't even know how to, how to balance all of that. But I do know what I can do. And I do believe in the power of Reiki and the love that we share and the intention that we set by sharing that love and for each other, for the people. I mean, really, I just look at, at the experience with the people. We had a total of 30 between the two classes and 
Um, and then the people that we met in the um, in the Reiki conference, just that really amazing love shared to me is what what it's what it's about and you know what we can do what we can do to make a difference yeah yeah and that's you know i think why so many are there you know what they're yeah. there i mean obviously it's our the miracle is also our own healing and that matters too and that's sometimes what we can do um, but just to hear these stories that, and, you know, whether it's outside of the mountain or on the mountain, just to hear these stories, but they're such perfect examples of why it does matter, why, it, how it helps, how it, what it does, it protected those people and created large miracles in the lives of all of them and their families. And in the different students and the individual stories, yeah, you know, because people are going through their own processes, their own healing. We had people with, you know, physical healing needs. We had people with emotional healing needs. We had people that, you know, were just moving into what they're manifesting next and empowerment and, you know, the different stories of caregiving that people were going through, um, you know, all different reasons that people are called to a, a trip like that or a journey like that. And when you're there, you know why you're called. Like, you know that it's that, like, oh, I need to go and I'm going to do what it takes to make that happen. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's just, again, the, um, the connection with the people is really beautiful. Mm. And so we are planning to go again. We don't have any dates set yet. So we'll keep everybody posted when we do that for 2024. Um, and we just, you know, we've been back a week and yeah. <laughs> have to look at everything. And William's, William's teaching. teaching in New York right yeah. now. And so, um, yeah, we, we have all that going on. Um, but I would imagine we'll we've got to get together with lena and she has to talk with sugaku-san and all of the above so um, be on the lookout for it in 2024 um so i would assume it would be either later in april or uh, maybe even in the fall of 2024 but again i don't i don't know we have weather things to think don't, about don't hold her to that <laughs> what's that don't hold you to that don't hold me to yeah. that because yeah. i don't know but yet. you're trying you're planning the point is is you're planning to try to make it an annual trip yeah and so if any of you are feeling called to it it's it's really exceptional it's it's really amazing and there's so much more stories to tell we had some challenges and we had some amazing you know ways that solutions and all kinds of things that you know again i i i actually have to go to the doctors to check my ears because they're still bothering me since november mm -hmm. um so i i can i have to end now but um like i say we'll keep sharing and um, you know, I'll try to get some of the photos and videos out. And um, if you haven't had the chance to go to our video on YouTube, our YouTube channel's Reiki Lifestyle, um, I did film some videos from the top of the mountain, um, some invocations. And so those are, I think, like you can really feel it. Even me watching it back, I was like, oh. They've been released on the podcast podcast platform, so they would have potentially okay. heard them um, if they decided to listen to it. But if you go to the YouTube channel, you can watch the video, especially the second one. That was a part of that with the that you did the video of the roots and the trees, and mm -hmm. you know I did that one a lot because we also played it <clears throat> uh, before we kind of released it publicly. We 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 played it in our next step classes. And so there's four of those. And then I, I watched it when I was preparing for those classes. 
And that second video, if you if you watch the first one where you're in the in that spot, and then um, where it's potentially where uh, uh, Yasui Sensei received Reiki, and then you watch the second one, <clears throat> I just have to laugh because it's like the second one is just like it's a trip, and I would I would kind of like kind of watch it and go into the invocation with eyes open. Sometimes I would close them. But the trees are dancing, and it is just really extraordinary um, to to be able to watch that because it is it's it's kind of fun. <laughs> well, and the first one was fun for me, although there is some background voices. Mm-hmm. And again, I just decided because the mountain was really crowded. The second week it wasn't as crowded, but the first week it was pretty crowded, and so I just finally thought. It's okay if I have background talking going on. It's like a human sound, like the birds. And so just be good with it. Yeah. And who knows what he was saying? The birds were very vocal at the same time. They were very vocal at the same time. But that first one for me, because I was watching myself with it, I was like, whoa, look at where I was. For for me, I felt like I was in such a state of that meditation Mm -hmm. and trying to do the technology at the same time and and, um, yet, you know, so in it. Um, Even if it's not where you say Sensei um, received Reiki, it's still a place of pilgrimage for millennia. And that builds energy and you know people have sat there praying and meditating and, you know, coming to the mountain for that peace and nature and, you know, all of those things that builds energy in that spot. And so it has a power there. Yeah, because the people of the mountain actually really only learned about Yusui Sensei maybe 20 years ago. Um, And primarily Jessica Miller, who wrote a book called The Birthplace of Reiki, which, by the way, is an exceptional book. You can get it on Amazon, The Birthplace of Reiki. And it really details um, Karama Mountain and all the shrines, etc. Anyway, she's the one who really brought it to their awareness and attention. And I think now, of course, they're very aware of it. And even while we were there, People recognized William that weren't in the class that just happened to be on Mount Karama at the same time and would come up to him. And and he's not really used to that, you know, so he was like, oh, that's so fascinating that people recognize me here, Um, but really from all over the world. So that that part was fun, too. So. Anyway, I know we have to close. Yep. Maybe we'll keep covering it as we go. Um, lots, lots to share. But again, for me, my heart is just filled with the love of the people. That was that was my big connection, and this was my first in person class since the pandemic. Say, yeah. And I mean, you've traveled, but not to that level. I haven't traveled to that level and I used to travel a lot and I hadn't traveled to that level. So it was my first kind of entrance. And I have to admit, it was a little bit like, okay, I have to get used to this um, and being around that many people. But that's, that's my big part of the whole thing was really remarkable people in the classes. Yeah. That that opening scene to love actually and closing. People are in the airport hugging. <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly what it felt like. Just love is actually all around. Love is actually all around. So love that. All right. Well, thank you for your stories. Thank you to everyone who listened and always joins us on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Um, I forget when this this uh, class or this podcast will be released, but we always have classes, either animal Reiki or human Reiki, basically monthly. Um, I think, and you have a Corona class coming up in June. I know it'll be released before that. So, and you only teach it a few times a year. So um, you can go to ReikiLifestyle.com to find out about all of our offerings and um, find out the dates and, and the classes that we teach there. We teach animal Reiki and we teach human Reiki.
And we have our distance Reiki share every Tuesday morning that's free and open to everyone, 9.30 to 11 a.m. Pacific time. And you are welcome to join us. You can join late and you can leave early if you need to. So it's open and casual and um, very inviting and stress-free. So it's open to everyone. You can go to Reiki Lifestyle to find out about that. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye now.